Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Madhava Be Jai 
यमुन थेरा यमुन थेरा have to sing. This is the, the instructions from the top. It's not coming from me, it's from the top. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to teach you a verse tonight. And then you can learn it. This is from uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. It's a verse chanted by Prahlad Maharaj, I'm not going to tell you the verse because you'll put it up on the board. <laughs> and then nobody, everyone will not be able to. They can chant it and see it after a while, but first you have to follow me and follow this. Okay, you ready now? You have to chant with all your strength, energy, might, and it's like you're in a fight for life. Now chant with that energy. <laughs> Ooh, you ready? Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Narasimhaya Om Namo Bhagavate Narasimhaya Namas Tejas Tejase Avir Avir Bhava Rajanaka Raja Damstra Kamasayan Radaya Radaya Tamo Grasa Grasa Om Swaha Abayam Abayam Atmani Booyasta Om Sham Okay. <laughs> Any demons here? Deal. Don't stick around too long because you'll be dead at the end of this class. <laughs> okay. Ready? We'll go again. Now we're going to do it a little bit longer in response. Ready? Om Namo Bhagavate Narasimhaya Om Namo Bhagavate Narasimhaya Namaste Jas Tejase Namaste Jas Tejase 
Avir Avir Bhava Rajanaka Rajadamstra Kamasayan Radhana Radhana Tamo Grasa Grasa Om Swaha Abayam Abayam Atmani Bhuyastha Om Sham Very good. You guys got some power. Okay. Now you're ready for the final test. Okay. We make sure you start when I stop. Om Namo Bhagavate Nara Sringhaya Namaste Jate Sase Avir Avir Bhava Rajanaka Rajadamsta Kamasayan Radaya Radaya Tamo Grasa Grasa Om Swaha Abhaya Mahaya Atmani Bhuyasta Om Sham Okay, put the verse on the board. 5.18.8 <laughs> Okay, repeat after me. Om, Om. O Lord Namaha, Namaha, my respectful obeisances. Bhagavate, Bhagavate, unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Godhead. Narasimhaya, known as Lord Nasimha. Known as Lord Nasimha. Namaha. Obeisances. Teja Teja say the power of all power. Avir Avir Bhava. Please be fully manifest. Rajanaka. O oh, you who possesses nails like thunderbolts. Rajadamstra. Are you, oh you who possesses teeth like thunderbolts. Kama asaya. Demoniac desires to be happy by material activities. Radaya radaya. Kindly vanquish. Tama. Ignorance in material world. Grasa. Kindly drive away. Grasa. Kindly drive away. Om. Oh my Lord. Swaha. Respectful oblations. Abayam. Fearlessness. Abhayam, fearlessness. Atmani, in my mind. Bhuyasta, may you appear. Om, O oh Lord. Sham, the bija or seed of mantras offering prayers to Lord Nisringha. Okay, yeah, you got it. Translation. I offer my respectful obeisances unto Lord Nisringadev, the source of all power. O Lord, who possesses nails and teeth just like thunderbolts, kindly vanquish our demon-like desires for fruit of activities in this material world. Please appear in our hearts and drive away our ignorance so that, you, by, so that by your mercy we may become fearless in the struggle for existence in the material world. 
Srimad Bhagavatam Sanat Kumara speaks the following words uh, to Maharaj. Yapada pankajam palasa vialasa bhakya kama sayam grahitam ugagrata yanti stahaha tarvam narbhikka matayo yatayo piru dhasrotaganasatam maranam bhaja vasudaivam. Translation. Devotees always engage in the service of the toes of the Lord's lotus feet can very easily become freed from the hard knotted desires for fruit of activities. This is very difficult for the non devotees. They can't stop the waves of material sense gratification. Going on down the Pradas, Harani Kashipu was the perfect representative of material life. He was therefore the cause of great disturbance to the topmost devotee, Balad Maharaj, until Lord Nishringadev killed him. <laughs> I'm just letting out my frustrations. <laughs> any, there, any devotees aspiring to be free from material desires should scream like that, no. <laughs> should offer his respectful embrace prayers to Nusringadev as Prahlad Maharaj did in this verse. Okay. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gana Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guravena Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padantikam Najai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Tananda Siddhvaita Gadadhar Sivasadim Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Srila Prabhupada So this is a very significant verse. You see, it doesn't come in the same series of verses in the pastime of Prahlad Maharaj and Lord Nisringadev. It appears in the fifth canto, and there's two verses, a few more verses that Prahlad speaks. But this one is directly uh, dir directed at Lord Nisringadev himself. And here he gave the Lord, uh, Prahlad Maharaj is asking for a benediction. It says, whenever there's a prayer, there's a benediction requested. So what is he asking for? Um, our life in this material world is just full of opportunities to fulfill material desires. And sometimes we are afflicted by that. So please, appear in our heart. He's already there in the heart. He's asking us, Prahlad's asking him to appear in the heart, but the Lord is already there. But what he means, he wants him to take the active position of removing within the heart those desires that are based on material gain. There's two kinds of material desires, or two ways that people plan to fulfill material desires. One is they do something and they want some result from that activity. More like immediate. I do so, I'm doing this so I can get this. And there's another way, whereas I do something and I'm waiting for the benediction to come after some time. In other words, immediate and extended. To get an immediate benefit and to make plans to get a benefit in the future. So people perform, and these are called fruit of activities. The word fruit, tiv, means fruit or fruit. When you grow a tree, you expect the tree to produce something. And if the tree has fruit, then that's a good tree. So the results of one's material desires come, with the, come in terms of the fruits of the results. Just like the tree gives results in the form of fruit. So the word fruitiv is used to indicate those activities that want something in return. And they are in the category of material. And so Prahlad Maharaj, although he's a pure devotee, you might say he's uh, making these pairs for our benefit. 
he's teaching us that how difficult it is to live in the material world and how difficult it is to overcome material desires. So he's saying that, my dear Lord, you have the power. We can't remove our desires for material gain. We are overcome by these desires. We are too weak and small. Material energy is too powerful. That's basically what he's saying. Therefore, only by your mercy, and then he asks us for that mercy in a sort of special way. Vrajanaka, Vrajadamstra. You have teeth like thunderbolts. You have nails like thunderbolts. In other words, your teeth and your nails destroy we see, when he appeared, Lord Nishringadev, he killed the demon Haranikashibu. And his teeth were so fierce that anyone who saw them was stricken with extreme fear. And he, he ripped apart the body of Haranikashibu with his nails, which were less, just like a Thunderbolts, because Haranikashipu's body was as strong as steel. He had received the benediction and nothing could, could hurt him. So it took the Lord himself personally to appear and rip him apart. And just as it's explained, they use the analogy, just as like you take a little insect and you squash it in your finger. Of course, devotees don't do that. <laughs> but that is possible, that can be done. But it shows that how insignificant, although very powerful materially, Harani Kashipu was to Lord Nisringadev. He simply cut him to pieces. <laughs> there was nothing left of him. So this is, um, so this Prahlad Maharaj is saying, Vrajanaka, nails like thunder, teeth like thunderbolts, and Vrajadamsta, nails like thunderbolts. And what, don't, it's like material desires are compared to Harani Kashipu's. <laughs> so the analogy fits nicely. That he represented the ultimate of material desires. What was his name? Haranya means gold. Kashipu means soft bed. So Prabhupada explains that this is what the materialists aspire for. Wealth and a, and constant comforts in material life. So they get wealth, so they can have as much comfort as they can in this world to make the body comfortable, happy, you know, whatever. So this is the materialist. So a material desire is called a harani kashipu. That's the analogy fits. So what Prahlad Maharaj says, we have these Harani Kashipus in our heart, which are material desires. And you are equipped to rip apart those desires by your nails and by your teeth. So therefore, appear in our hearts and do the work. <laughs> and this will free us from ignorance. And what will be the result? We will become fearless. <laughs> so here is a very important principle because the material world is uh, called uh, bayam. Bayam means fear. Mm -hmm. It's a place of fear. There's nobody in this world who doesn't have some kind of fear. Even Lord Indra, who was a powerful demigod, has fear of losing his position by someone performing austerities in order to get his position. So sometimes he reacts he was afraid that Prithu Maharaj would, would do more horse sacrifices than he did and become the topmost worshipful person for performing Asvamedha Yagyas. And so he stole the horse. Indra, powerful. He's got a lot of power. He rules the heavens. He rule, he's the king of all the demigods. But still, he's in fear. So in this world, everyone's afraid of something. Afraid of not getting, afraid of losing, afraid of not enjoying what I get. That fear is always there in people's lives. Now everyone's afraid of getting disease. People wear masks because they think that's going to save them from getting diseased. Or they do this, they take this, they do that, they do this. Everyone's fearful. 
and they take precautions. So taking precautions is normal and natural, but still the fear element is there. It's there everywhere. This is the spiritual world is called avayam, means without fear. There's no fear in the spiritual world because there's no threat. Everything is chintamani. Everything is pleasing, full of knowledge, and ultimately joyful, unlimitedly. So this is the spiritual, the material world is characterized by fear. So what is Prahlad Maharaj saying? Give us fearlessness, because we have to live in this world. Somehow we have to struggle. And Prahlad's only a five-year boy. He's got a whole life in front of him. You'll see, as he grows up, he becomes king of the Daiches, and he has many challenges in his life. In the later part of his life, is mentioned in, in some places how he had to fight uh, others in order to maintain his position as king. And so, any, you know, no matter who you are, no matter what your position is, you know, people who have a lot of money, a lot of power, a lot of prestige, a lot of influence in this world, they're probably the most fearful. They're probably the most fearful. And statistics prove that. They're afraid of losing what they got, not getting more, or somebody's coming to steal what they have or somebody's kind of trying to kill them because of what they have. Mm -hmm. Fear is always there. And you'll see the more rich a person has, the more bars they have around their house, <laughs> the, more, the more dogs they keep, the more guards they keep. <laughs> so this fear aspect, and you see in the world, just like, I mean, what is one of the biggest businesses in the world? Locks and keys, you know, <laughs> there are just locks on everything, keys on everything. Everyone's afraid of losing something, getting, or we have to take so many precautions. We sometimes we're in our own house and, it, and the lights go out and we get afraid. <laughs> we can't see anything and we think, oh, no, oh my God, in the darkness there must be a hundred people just came and they're all trying to attack me. So because we, the darkness gives you, gives you no understanding of what's in front of you, you become fearful. You run to the light switch, you turn on your candles. And <laughs> so yeah, so this, is, uh, this fear element is very strong in the material world. In fact, it's very powerful. And that's mentioned in the Brahma Samhita that from Indra, the king of Indra, to Indra Gopa, Indragopa is the smallest little tiny insect in existence. There's nothing smaller than that the germ. It says that from that, from Indra to Indragopa germ, everyone in between, including these two, are fearful. <laughs> you see, the little ant is running along the ground. You put your finger, he gets stuck and he runs the other way. He's, he's afraid of getting, you know. So, in, in, uh, Demigod life, they are fearful of losing their positions. In human life, they're fearful of everything. <laughs> and in animal life, they live in fear every moment. An animal lives in fear. The characteristic of animal life is fear. If you want to know the, the consciousness of the living entities in different categories, human beings are always lamenting and Demigods are always happy, and animals are always fearful. These three categories, fear, lamentation, and, and jubilation, make up the three realms of existence. The higher planets, the middle planets, and then the, then the animal level, levels. So Prahlad Maharaj, he knows how dangerous this material world is, and how easy it is to become afflicted by material desires. So he's praying. He's praying to the Lord, and he prays to Lord Nishringadev because he knows Lord Nishringadev has come to kill his father who is material desire personified. <laughs> there is no one more expert at, at having material desires and filling material. Harani Kashipu had all the demigods in a fearful situation. Everyone except Brahma and Shiva. And, and Narada Muni. These are the only three of the demigods who weren't fearful of Rani Kashipu. 
Brahma and Shiva didn't do anything, but they were at the same time, they weren't fearful. But Narada Rishi wasn't, he understood everything, so he remained fearless. But there's 33 million demigods, and it's mentioned that every one of them was afraid because Rani Kashipu would take the demigods and make, him, make them his servants and ask them to do, and order them to do different things. He even told them how to change the whole atmosphere. He wanted to make it that if you, if you perform pious activities, you go to heaven, and if you, I mean, if you perform impious activities, you go to heaven, and if you perform pious activities, you go to hell. <laughs> He wanted to reverse the whole process of karma. <laughs> and he asked the demigods to help him. <laughs> and so this, this was Harani Kasipu. He was so powerful. And he had the benediction. He couldn't be killed in so many different ways. But no one could kill him. But only the Lord could do it. Because the Lord is the supreme power of all powers. <laughs> Harani Khan, Prahlad Maharaj, interesting. His father felt that his own son, five-year-old boy, devotee of the Lord, who, who didn't want to follow his father. Everyone, he couldn't say, you know, everyone listens to me but except you. You're, the, you're defying my order. Where do you get your power from? <laughs> he was amazed how his little son was defying his order. So, in so many ways, he tried to change his little son. When at first he tried to preach to his son, or when he heard his son preach Krishna consciousness, he thought, the poor boy is being deluded, he's in bad association. Vaishnavas are coming to pollute his consciousness. He sent him back to school and he told him, his teachers, Sanda Namarka, what are you teaching this boy? We're not teaching him anything. <laughs> Where is he getting this knowledge from? We don't know. Must be Vaishnavas coming in disguise into the school and, and influencing him. All right, train him up in the right way. Teach him how to become a good demon. You know, teach him how to destroy his enemies. Teach him how to become a good, you know, politician. <laughs> and so they took him back. They tried everything. Pallad Maharaj started preaching to his school, to his teachers. And then, when he came back to his father, he asked his father, asked him again, "What did you learn?" Said the same thing. Kept preaching to his father about the glories of devotional service. Told his father to get out of Maya. <laughs> his father became angry at the teachers. Now, he said, "You know, you're Brahmins, and you're teaching him this." You're defying my order. He got angry with them. They said, be careful, Rani Kashifu, we're Brahmins. You're going to offend us. <laughs> he became even more angry. So then he didn't know what to do. Then he realized it wasn't the teachers. It wasn't the Vaishnavas. Where is he getting all this knowledge? Couldn't change him. And then Prahlad started really preaching to him heavy. And he said, my dear father, if you really want to be happy, you have to take the dust of the lotus feet of the pure devotees and place it on your head and go to Vrindavan. <laughs> he didn't want, his father didn't want to hear any of that. So he decided, well, and then his father used an analogy. You are simply like a body that has one part of the body that's diseased. So when the body is diseased, if you don't cure that disease, it'll kill the whole body. So you're like a disease to the, to the body of the demons here. So therefore, you're going to have to go. So he decided to kill his own son. So he put him under the care of, or under the control of his servants or demons. They tried to stab him with pitchforks. They tried to poison him. They threw him in a pit of snakes. They tried to, they tried to throw him off a mountain. They did. But everything didn't work. Krishna protected him completely. He was completely unharmed. They couldn't do anything. They sent him to Brahmins to chant mantras to destroy him by evil, evil mantras. That didn't work. Finally, they threw him in the ocean and put it through a mountain on top of him so he couldn't get out of the ocean. They tried everything. And then his father was amazed to see that 
everything he tried, he couldn't kill him. And then he decided to kill him himself. So when he did that, he took out his sword. Then Dharanishringadev appeared and finished off this demon. So Prahlad had that fearlessness. He's praying for the fearlessness, but he's teaching us that if you want to live in this world, you have to become fearless. And the only way you can become fearless is you have to get rid of material desires. Because if you have material desires, you cannot become fearless. It's not possible. Because these material desires will also always create within you the desire to fulfill them. And therefore you live in fear in one form or another. So therefore a devotee can be fearless only, as it says here, get rid of these material desires, pray to Lord Nishringadev to appear in the heart. He has the power, he has the mercy. When the, when the prayers are sincere, the Lord acts. And when the Lord acts, then everyone becomes free from all material influences, material desires, material dangers, material illusions. Lord Nishingadeva is simply equipped to give protection to the devotees on all levels. He's equipped to show you, oh, you're looking at that object and you think that will make you happy. It won't. In other words, he shows you the material illusions that you get attracted to. This is not going to make you happy. He shows you. By, your, by his power, he reveals to you, this is the illusion of maya. Do not become attracted or attached to it. And the last thing he does is what here he says with Prahlad Maharaj was, he gets rid of those desires within our heart by the power of his mercy. So we can pray to Prahlad Maharaj, so we can pray like Prahlad Maharaj, we, it may not be so easy to pray like Prahlad Maharaj. That's, uh, that's even to pray like him requires great faith and what we say complete attachment to the lotus feet of the Lord. But he's giving us the formula here by this beautiful prayer. So if this prayer, if we can pray this prayer every day, at least once a day, you will gradually start to feel the effects of that prayer and develop fearlessness and material desires will start to go. Because the Lord is always is more eager to help us than we actually want his help. A devotee may want to get rid of material desires, but the intensity of the Lord's desire to help us is much greater than our desire to help ourselves. So he can, he, he can help us and he wants to help us more and more and more. So material desires are like demons. They sit within the mind, they sit within the heart. <clears throat> and there are two kinds of material desires, gross and subtle. Gross is the ones we, every day we, file, we chant these, well we don't chant, but we make, we understand no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, no gambling. Srila Prabhupada said all material desires sit within these four categories. If you can follow these four, all the gross material desires you can become free from. And what is the subtle material desires? Profit, adoration, and distinction. I want to be known as a great devotee. I want people to say, Jai Maharaj, Haribo, you're so nice. Here's a donation. <laughs> so yeah, we want some reciprocation. We want some acknowledgement. We want some glorification. We want some acknowledgement, something. If somebody we know doesn't say hello to us that day, we think, oh my God, what happened? What's wrong with him? Doesn't he know who I am? <laughs> so we get, sometimes we get upset if something doesn't happen and we expect things. So but expecting material things to happen is another form of subtle material desires. So we want this or we want that. We should want Krishna, we should want devotional service, we should want those qualities that help us perform devotional service. 
We can have many desires. Prahlad Maharaj is praying. He's asking for something. He's asking for the Lord's mercy to get rid of material desires and he's asking to become fearless. He's asking for two things in this one verse. So in the next verse, you'll see in the purport, it mentions in verse number nine, it says, wherever there's a material, wherever there's a, a prayer, there is a desire. Every prayer has a desire. So <clears throat> praying for material things doesn't mean you will be happy by it. Even if you achieve something material, sometimes people think, oh, I want to get married, and that person is the person I want to get married, and that will make me happy, and I will be sailing above the clouds in my swan-like vimana, going everywhere in the universe, so happy, smiling, and we'll, we'll live life together eternally, and then it's not like that. <laughs> got to pay the rent. <laughs> got to work. You got to raise the kids. You got to do this. You got to do that. And then when they don't work, when I told you to do this, I know you told me, but because you told me, I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's married life. <laughs> so yeah. So I'm, you know, we're getting into another subject here. <laughs> I think we lost one person on that one. <laughs> All right, I hope I didn't say anything to scare you. Okay, come back. <laughs> All right, but so many things that we, we have to really understand that fulfilling material desires doesn't mean those things are going to make you happy. It's not possible. Because material desires are, are, have two things, they have two sides to it. They can bring some satisfaction or some peace of mind, or they can bring ultimate misery and suffering. And that's true with anything. You can have money and it can make you happy, you can have money it can make you totally miserable. You can have a wife or a husband, it can make you happy, it can make you totally miserable. Everything in this world, you can look at this piece of pizza and you think it's going to make you happy and you're so hungry you chew on it so fast and you choke on the cheese and you die. You know. <laughs> so, you know, this is the way material life is. Yeah, people die, actually. One of the biggest causes of death in restaurants is people eating meat because they get so lusty after the meat, they eat so fast that it gets stuck in their throat and they choke. Yeah, they, in some restaurants they have these long forks that when people get choke on the meat, they, and these guys run and they try to take the meat stuck in your throat out with these long forks. Really, and this happens in, in countries that are big meat-eating countries. So yeah, even, even you, you're eating and you think you're going to enjoy, you could die in the next minute. You're going to bed and you sleep on your very nice, luxurious bed, and it's like two feet, off, two meters off the floor. It takes you a ladder to climb into your bed, you know. So, and then you roll around in your bed, and then you fall off and you die. It's happened. People have died in their sleep because they rolled off their bed and fell on the floor. <laughs> there has been reports from that. So yeah, so you, everyone's thinking material things are going to make me happy, but. As we mentioned, they have two sides to it. They can bring disaster or they can bring something pleasing. Either way, one side or the other. So you, you can't tell. <clears throat> so yeah, and that's just the way life is in this material world. But when you get rid of material desires and then you take on spiritual desires, then spiritual desires always bring satisfaction and peace. Even if you can't fulfill them completely, even if you fulfill them partially, to that degree you get satisfaction and happiness. That is the nature of spiritual, because spiritual is perfect, there's nothing wrong in spiritual. When you're performing some devotional service, even if you don't do it right, but you're trying to do it right, it's perfect. It's perfect, because it's spiritual, it's for Krishna, it's for, it's for service. And that gives you satisfaction. Even if you don't do it right, you should try to do it right, but simply because you're, you're worshiping the Lord, 
there's no question of right and wrong. What makes something right and wrong is that if we don't follow instructions. Then it's still right because we're doing something in devotional service, but it has an element of not giving full satisfaction. But it gives, does give some satisfaction. Even if you chant Hare Krishna and you're not chanting it properly, there's some benefit. But if you chant it properly, then you'll get more benefit. And if you chant it devotionally, you get the, the full benefit. So that's spiritual. You can't lose. In spiritual life, you can't lose. Everything you do is a win. In material life, you can't win and you can't stop playing. <laughs> the materialists, they can't stop. Their, it says here, it says in this particular purport, it says here, it's interesting. It's right in the beginning of the purport. It says, big, the non-devotees, the jnanis and the yogis, cannot stop the waves of sense gratification, although they try to do so. They can't stop getting material desires, although they're trying to get rid of material desires. They can't, because they're not, in, not engaged in devotional service. They're not on the bhakti platform. So, material, spiritual life means that we are connecting to the higher energy and therefore everything becomes auspicious. And that auspiciousness comes in the form of becoming fearless. Those who are fearless are happy. A, a devotee is fearless because they know nothing can happen unless, unless the Lord allows it to happen. Of course, a devotee doesn't do anything to act in the wrong way. They always act in the proper way. But if, even in acting in the proper way, if something fearful comes up, they know Krishna's there. Krishna's there to protect. And he will. But if we act wrongly, then we might get a little slap just to teach us that you shouldn't act like this. Just like this COVID virus, you know, you have to be careful. You have to take precautions. If you're careless and you act care carefree and you don't take proper precautions, you may get sick. And you say, well, I thought Krishna's protecting me. Well, he does. He gives you intelligence how to protect yourself. And if you follow that, then he protects you. <laughs> but if, he, if you don't follow his instructions or he doesn't follow the instructions you should follow, then you get a little bit of a uh, uh, a wake-up call, a little slap just to teach you this is not right. But in, in any case, the devotee is always takes shelter of the Lord and he knows that by taking shelter of the Lord, one can become fearless. <laughs> okay. All right, so these are some comments or questions. These are some comments on this particular verse. Any comments or questions? Hare Krishna, thank you for your nice lecture. Avaduta Rai Prabhu is asking, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. This is just my observation, perhaps not to, perhaps not perfect, but I know a few experts in martial arts, they look really fearless. They practice a kind of meditation. Mm -hmm. And but that fearlessness is not is is based on some idea that uh, I I'm a good fighter, <laughs> but it's it's flawed with because it's not completely dependent on the Lord. They can act fearless, but still they're trying to protect themselves in so many ways. <laughs> the only doesn't have to make any big arrangements for protection. All he has to do is depend on the Lord. Here's another comment and a question also. I read the son I read the sons of Diti, the demons, making Pralat best of demoniac family. The calf produced liquor in an iron pot. And the question is why Pralada lets him Pralada lets himself be used to get ingredients for liquor for the demons? 
How does he not become guilty and get Papa? <laughs> That's in the past time of Pritu Maharaj, milking the earth. Yeah, he's born in a Daichi family, he's just serving the demons, that's all. <laughs> I don't know. It, this is what the verse says. It doesn't give any explanation. The verse says what it says. It says, just like he said, whatever he said is correct. He's facilitating the demons. Everyone is getting their share from the earth, because everyone now is getting, they have a saintly king. Just like when you have a saintly king and everything goes on, then people get what they want. But still, the demons are the demons and the devotees are the devotees. Why is, will, will Pallad Maharaj get a reaction for that? Doesn't sound like it because he's, he's acting in, uh, on behalf of the demons which were part of this yagya that was going on. So I don't really know the complete answer on that. All I know is that Prahlad Maharaj is free from any material reactions. <laughs> that we can say for sure. But he is, he is, he is uh, the king of the demons because he was born in a demon family and when his father was kid, killed, he was made king. So he ruled the demons. You have Kuvera. He is the uh, his uh, progeny are the Yakshas. The Yakshas are mystical demons, <laughs> and there's a big fight between Dhruva Maharaj and the Yakshas in the fourth canto. And Kuvera, he's a demigod. He he came to. Uh, Dhruva Maharaj told him, stop killing my family members. <laughs> he, he said, I know they're rascals, but don't kill them. <laughs> and Dhruva Maharaj consented. And then, so we see example where the, the different devas, or even patients, are representing other, other living entities who are on a lower level. Yeah, but Pallad Maharaj is called the, the, the king of the Daiches. Mm -hmm. That's one of his titles. Because <laughs> he was born in that family. But he's not a Daichya. He's just the king of the Daiches. Mm -hmm. Hard to understand, isn't it? I don't know if this is a proper analogy, just like what's going on in the world today. So the demons are, are people are sinful. People are sinful, and so they're getting their reactions for their sinful activity in the form of suffering in different ways. So Krishna lets it go on. Why? Because he doesn't interfere with the material energy. He puts the material energy in position and he gives the modes of ignorance have certain characteristics and qualities and activities. The mode of passion also, the mode of goodness also. People who act in a mode of ignorance, they're going to get their reactions like that. And Krishna sanctions that because he sanctions the operation and when they plug into the operation, they get the results. So right now the demons are, are very powerful because people are worshipping the demons by committing sinful activities. And therefore, in one sense, in an indirect sense, people are worshipping demons because they represent sinful activities. And Krishna doesn't get involved with that. He gets involved when his devotees are in trouble, then he gets involved. So when the devotees get harassed, just like here, we saw from this example, this pastime, when the demigods came to, uh, to the Lord and said, this, this demon, Harani Kashipu, is so powerful, he's causing so much havoc. And the Lord said, I know all about Harani Kashipu. 
but I, I, I'll, I'll take action when he harasses my devotee. Now this is where the, the Lord comes in. When the devotees are in trouble and they call out for Krishna, then Krishna comes. And so the devotees are not affected by what goes on in the three modes because they are above the modes. But the modes are going on and people are getting their reactions and Krishna is not interfering with that. He, leave, he sets the law of karma in motion and it works accordingly. Like that. That's why when people pray to the Lord for materialistic people, when they pray to the Lord for something, they don't necessarily get it because they're living differently than what their prayer is. They're living sinfully and they want something beneficial. But they have to get their karma because that's, that's what they're connected to. They're connected to their karma through the activities they perform. Like that. Just like in World War II, when the ladies from, I think it was from, I probably said from Germany and from England, they went to the churches, they went to the temples, and they, they, were, they were wives of the soldiers, they were sisters of the soldiers, they were daughters of the soldiers in, in fighting, and they prayed. Please bring back my husband, bring back my brother, bring back my, uh, my uh, son. And when they didn't come back, they were killed. The people gave up on God. So when materialistic people pray, jai shishi panchatattva ki jai. When materialistic people pray, and their activities are different than their, their prayers, then they can't expect that the Lord's going to answer their prayers because they're living differently, or they're acting wrongly. Yes? Can I ask one question? Yeah, please. Um, uh, I don't know if it, it's appropriate, but I will still ask. Uh, uh, once I was in Mexico, uh, one friend uh, took me to a church. Uh, uh, it, it was on Coyacan place, uh, very uh, well known, uh, uh, a place in Mexico City. And there is an old church uh, built on the top of the pyramid. Uh, from, and uh, there was uh, Hernando Cortez. Uh, he, uh, built this church uh, and he took me to this church and to the uh, to the chapel on the left side and we were sitting uh, for about 15 mi minutes there and then uh, this uh, friend uh, 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 he uh, brought me there to show me one uh, thing and there uh, in the uh, in one part of the church where the uh, was uh, like a being 5,000 years old um, and people uh, when they were like praying to God uh, they were uh, praying uh, for uh, selfish uh, reasons like uh, to stay healthy or things like that, material desires and through that uh, uh, prayers of these people in church uh, because uh, church was full of people uh, this being was somehow connected uh, through these prayers with uh, people uh, and it was like eating our energy uh, only from our prayers and, uh, and this was very old being uh, and then uh, uh, one lady came and she was all dressed in white and uh, she was like something uh, like bet between a nun or a bride you couldn't tell and she uh, was all, she also had like this uh, chanting for chanting in white and also like nails in white everything and also the ch the book for prayers in white i don't know it is it was very strange thing i don't know and then i saw that this being couldn't touch this uh, uh, lady uh, mm -hmm. And then I asked my friend, uh, what is happening? Uh, 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 what was this lady about? And uh, she, uh, he told me that she came to show us uh, how uh, to, uh, not to be touched by, by those kind of uh, things. And uh, when I saw that this lady didn't uh, pray for uh, desires like uh, 
uh, yeah. to stay healthy or to gain some benefits or something else. She was only praying for the purity of her spirit uh, in some way. And she uh, couldn't be touched with that. Yeah. So if I, you have any comment on that... Yeah, because she's connected with God. Mm -hmm. And therefore she couldn't be touched. <laughs> So it is a difference between uh, the kind of praying. Uh, yeah, well, you need pray for material things. You, you sometimes you may get it, but a lot of time, other times you may not get it. Because, but as I explained, material things, even if you get it, doesn't mean you're going to be happy with it. There was one. Uh, there was one uh, monk in one church in somewhere in Europe. Um, he was the, what we say, the most holy monk in the ashram. And he was the pot washer. He used to wash the pots. That was his service. He was washing the pots all the time. Now, everyone understood that he is the most advanced spiritually. And that word became known to many people. So people would write to him may write him a letter and say that my uh, friend is sick, can you pray for them? And he said, I can't do that. Because God may have wanted him to become sick to learn something or to grow into something or to, God has a reason for allowing that person to become sick. So I don't want to, in, I don't want to make a prayer to interfere with God's, you know, plan. So I can't do that. So anybody who prayed for any, asked him for anything material, he said, I can't, I can't do that. But if they prayed for devotion, or they asked for devotion, then he would grant, he would offer prayers to help them with devotion. But when they asked for anything material, he said, I can't do that. Because God has put him in that position and there's some reason for that. <laughs> yeah, so material things, you can't, when you understand that good and bad is simply words, it has no meaning materially. In this world there's nothing good and there's nothing bad. It's all, it's all bad really because it's opposite spiritual. To say this is good and this is bad, even Lord Chaitanya, he said, some people say this is good and others say this is bad, but I say this is all mental speculation. <laughs> Because for some people this is good, and for some people this is the same thing as bad. For some people, what happens one day to them is good, and the same thing happens to them another day is not good. <laughs> so good and bad is all, it's all you know, an idea, that's all. This is good, this is bad. <laughs> that's why when they, people pray for something material, they're really not praying to God, they're really praying to some kind of energy to somehow fulfill some desires to be happy in this material world. But material happiness doesn't mean you'll become spiritually successful. Even some of the people who will suffer the most in this world have become the greatest saints. <laughs> So you can't equate or compare material prayers to spiritual prayers. One is uh, uncertain and it's about selfishness, but God wants something from us. He wants us to come back to him. So when we pray with, with those prayers in mind, then we are protected and we also we come closer to God. <laughs> So if we, if we understand what God wants from us, then, then, then everything becomes natural. Mm -hmm. So this prayer is one of those kind of prayers? Yeah. He's praying to get rid of material desires and to, to have fearlessness of them, so he can go on in the material world and serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, isn't, this is not a selfish prayer. Mm -hmm. Interesting experience you had. I, uh, that's really nice. You should write that all down into a little 
you know, put it on paper and write it down. You can even write it down and write it down in your own language, in Slovenian, and then maybe yes, the book. Sometimes I have a feeling that I shouldn't talk about this. It's interesting. I found it very interesting. And it's also very instructive, too. <laughs> if you want, I was just a suggestion. Okay, anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Srila uh, Prabhupada ki jai, Sringa Bhagavan ki jai, Pallad Maharaj ki jai.